If the most valuable thing a person gets from their job is a paycheck, they're in the wrong job. Yeah. And the problem is they're waiting for someone to give them the right job, but that someone is not going to show up until you do. You've got to decide what it is you want. Now hey, 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 guys, it is Allison. I am the host of your show, Allison Answers Mission Awake. I cannot wait to sit down with you today and go over how we are going to crush the mediocrity in your life that has been plaguing our society since the beginning of time. I cannot wait to have a real deal conversation that includes intelligence, fun, excitement, and real actionable steps to make a real difference in the life that you're living now and making it into something you can be damn proud of and excited to live. Sit down, put on your damn seatbelt, and get ready for the ride of your life. Hi, guys. I would love to tell you a little bit about my next guest. He is Gregory Offner. And what I want to tell you about him is some really, really, really cool things. Gregory Offner was a world-renowned entertainer who performed at piano bars and dueling piano shows. He delighted his audiences with like high energy, high engaging, all request kind of experiences. And he would say like that there was no two performances that were ever the same, but then tragedy struck in this man's life. Gregory was handed two options, either lose his ability to speak forever or undergo this vocal surgery that would require a complicated and lengthy recovery. He soon learned that this first procedure was only the beginning. And five years, 15 surgeries later, Gregory transformed both his voice and his life. Today, he's an award-winning keynote performer. Gregory helps organizations and the people within them to elevate their experience at work and uses the piano bar secrets to inspire their people, amplify teamwork and collaboration and build organizations full of highly fulfilled, high-performing people. He discovered his perspectives on navigating change and his passion for creating experiences that just rock you know, that could serve, inspire, delight audiences around the world. His use of music and his programs as a metaphor for engagement and resilience connects with the audiences in a really deep and unforgettable performance, leaving them refreshed and equipped with skills to reframe obstacles as opportunities. His programs have a broad appeal because he has customized them to suit the events with a diverse mix of roles and responsibilities in the audience, as well as for audience that are composed of, ma of mainly of leaders. The thing about Gregory that interests me and the reason that I wanted him on is that he's a really dynamic person who's overcome a lot. He's a multi-talented individual with a passion for entertaining and educating others. And who doesn't need that? We need that in our life today. We're so educated on things that don't inspire us. We really need that. His keynotes, workshops, and corporate consulting engagement help the world's leading organizations create high-performing, high-fulfilled leaders. Prior to his work, Greg led global sales and marketing efforts for several Fortune 100 organizations, brokered complex risk management insurance programs for large commercial organizations, and drove process improvement initiatives as a certified Lean Six Sigma practitioner, which I don't even know what that means. We'll have to find out. You know, the thing is, what, what it says here is that during that time, Greg lived a double life. By day, he was a suit and tie wearing professional, but under the cover of night, Greg was better known as Junior, a world-renowned professional dueling pianist. As an entertainer, he performed on stages of every size, and it says on, on five continents, which is really cool. His ability to integrate that fun energy into his programming, and that's what's cool. That's what interests me about him, is that he has that really high energy, that great energy and passion. You know, and then he also has that really good understanding of, you know, of business and and the 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 skeleton underneath the meat. Greg works as a keynote speaker, coach, and workshop facilitator. He fills the void in most organizations, you know, that kind of like helps them to 
have this training program that develops these skills that develop them personally, which you know that I say all the time that to the degree that someone personally develops is to the degree that someone develops a level of success in any business or anything like that. So I want to just read this other thing that's written here because I think it's interesting. Most recently, Greg has spent over two months in total silence. Now, this was at a different period of time, but he has spent two months in total silence as a result of multiple surgeries, which I think is fascinating. He needed to repair and rebuild his vocal cords, an experience that nearly left him mute and which ignited that critical spark needed to transform his work from personal curiosity to like a professional mission. And he's really engaged in helping individuals and organizations identify the one change that can change everything. And through a mix of speaking, which is so interesting, I think that he had this incredible tragedy that left him without voice and that then turns into this triumph of an incredible speaker, which I just love stories like this. And through a mix of speaking and audience participation and a little dueling piano bar magic sprinkled in, Greg reveals the insights and tools you need to accelerate your growth, amplify your creativity, and deliver a performance that leaves your audience, clients, stakeholders, whoever it is, employees, your life, your, your relationships, cheering for an encore. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring uh, Greg on. I'm looking forward to getting to know him. This is the first time I'm meeting him. And after just researching him, I think that we'll all gain a lot from it. Whether you're an employer, an employee, whether no matter what, who you are, what walk of life that you're looking to make a change in, try to utilize his skills in what he's telling you how to upgrade your personal development. I think you are in for a good surprise. And I think I am too. I'm really lo- looking forward to learning from Greg. Hey, 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 guys, how are you today? It is Allison from Allison Answers and Logger Counseling Services. As you heard, I have Greg Offner on. And I think you are, go- I don't think, you didn't hear me say that. I know that you are going to get great value from Gregory. What he will provide today is an insight into how to overcome difficulty and how to transform your life into something uh, like take chicken shit and turn it into chicken salad. Like this guy knows what he's talking about. And as you heard, with all of the accolades I gave him just two minutes ago, he has he's a man to listen to. So what I'd like just you guys to do is understand if you're an entrepreneur, a business owner, if you're an employee or an employer, what Greg is going to give you is something that can transform your vocational life. He can transform the way you're living your life. So put your listening ears on and let's go. Greg, it is such a pleasure to have you. I just met you, but I know that you have so much to offer. So Tell us, if you don't mind, tell us what your, basically your backstory, because I did share with them about your vocal injury, and I find that very profound. So if you could just share a bit on that, and then we'll talk about what you do. Sure. Yeah, it it was a huge experience in my life. And when I think about the idea of post-traumatic growth, that for so many of us, it takes a traumatic incident, you know, the sort of kick in the pants from the universe to really achieve the growth that were, were poss- uh, that's possible for ourselves, that was it for me. Uh, that was the universe shaking me and saying, hey, dummy, you need to do what you're here to do because if you keep doing what you're doing, ain't gonna work out that well for you. Because up until that point in time, I had a day job that you know more than paid the bills, but I wasn't really passionate about it. It was just a J-O-B job. And I think everybody knew that I was kind of faking my way through it. At night, I got to play at piano bars all over the world, and I, I loved it. Look, it didn't pay the best, but the emotional paycheck that I got, the fulfillment that I got from that was more than worth all of the travel and the late nights and the craziness that comes with it. I mean, to be honest, I kind of I kind of liked that. I liked the craziness, if I'm being honest, I did. But when did I, I lost ask? both of those things. What's I, that? Go ahead. I'm not going to ask. What is the craziness? But then we'll we'll derail. I'm not going to even ask. Oh, my God. 
come on. I mean, all the characters you meet at piano, you know, at just at bars in general, right? But then piano bars are there. I've met so many interesting and fascinating people. I've met some frustrating people. I've been in all sorts of circumstances that people who've worked in bars are going, yeah, I, I bet I know what kind of circumstances he's been involved in. Because you get a very diverse crowd. But I like that. I love getting to meet people. In the work that I do now, I still travel a lot. And one of my favorite places to be is an airport. I don't like to be stuck at an airport, not like forced to be there, but that hour or so that I have before the flight I think the emotions that you see at an airport are some of the purest and most interesting to me because you're really capturing people in this in this element. They're they're either moving to and fro, they're reconnecting with like I love when I'm walking, I'm imagining Chicago O'Hare, the terminal that I'm always in, and I love when you hear that, you know, out of, out of the left side of your of your ear, you hear Bob Girl, hey, <laughs> you know, and the big back slap hug that you hear and that, well, I haven't seen you since, what, like five years ago, that kind. and it's just, that's, that's real, that's raw, and you don't get to witness that every day as a bystander, and I thrive on that type of thing, and so at the piano bar, I've seen proposals, I've seen, you know, vodka in the face breakups, like, we've seen all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm not even going to tell you what I see at the airport, what I've done at the <laughs> Like it's bad. It's, you like have a positive perspective. I'm like, where the hell is my luggage? You know, like and you that. see that too. And I mean, yeah. listen, as someone as someone who practices helping other people navigate emotion, what yeah. you? I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. <laughs> you probably appreciate more than me how fascinating it is to have that third party fly on the wall perspective when someone else is doing it and go, wow. Because now I find it easier to check my own emotion and sort of check my behavior in those circumstances because I've seen enough of that to be able to say, look, this person on the other side of the airline desk or whatever, like they don't get paid extra if I don't make my flight or if I don't get an upgrade or if I can't check. It's, it's not them versus me. It's us versus the problem. And anytime I think you approach a situation in that way, the outcome may not be what you want, but it's better than you'd get otherwise. I love that. And you know what? I'm I'm going to use this when we're going to segue into what you do, because the air, the airport employees and how they see work. But I don't we're going to put that on the shelf for a minute. I just want you to because okay. what really stands out to me when I was reading about you, that you were silent for two months because of all of these surgeries. Right. And now mm -hmm. what really sticks stood out to me was that, and I love what you said, you said post-traumatic growth. That is, that is the best word. I love that. You know? So what I'm picturing, the first thing I thought of, I'm picturing this man, you are so clearly well-spoken. You're so clearly dynamic in what you do. That is everything I, I could tell who you are, your use of language. And now it's silenced for a period of time. I love that. I feel like that is so spiritual. It's incredible to me. So I feel like there's so many biblical references to that anyhow, about people who are, they're most afraid and then they're they're called out to be like Gideon, you mighty man of valor, who was like the scaredest man on earth. So it just hit me when you when I read that about you. So, and mm -hmm. I feel like that has been such a transformational part of who you are and what's made you to be such a dynamic and helpful person to others. So that's just my take on you. And I don't even know you, but it just really hit me when I read it. So we'll see friends. This is why Allison's great at what she does. Cause she's, she's picking up a lot of these subtle things. Even not down, me, people. Yeah. That are, that are yeah. true. And so there's, there's, there's two ways to look at that experience. One is that, yes, it was very cathartic for me. It forced me to notice a lot of things that I didn't pay attention to because in silence, you have to find other ways to participate. And initially, sort of like the stages of grief, I'm by no means an expert, but there's a bit of, a bit of denial that, okay, well, well, no, I can still, I can still do what I need to do. And so even though the doctors had told me, Greg, you need to be silent, like you need to pull back from these social situations because your voice can't handle it, I didn't listen. Yeah. And that made the situation worse initially for me. Mm. And in there was a lesson for me. And that was, I had never really stopped to pause and listen. It wasn't just in this situation about my voice, it was in life because in that time of silence, I had a lot of time for reflection. 
And in that reflection, the places where I went against my gut and made choices became so clear to me. When I was in school, my first, my, for my freshman year of college, I knew it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to be a musician. And at the time, early 2000s, YouTube wasn't a thing. Record companies still reigned supreme. The way you did that was you moved to Los Angeles and you waited tables and you got involved in bands. And, and, and I knew that's where I belonged. But I listened to people around me who said, hey, you're young, you don't know, here's what you should do. Going into certain careers and making certain moves, that same pattern repeated itself. Listening or looking to other people for the answers. And I realized that if I was going to get what I really wanted out of life in this next chapter, I had to push all that aside and I had to go with my gut again. And the scary part about that was despite all of the change you'd think I was going through, the biggest change I was about to go through was to leave the W-2 world, to leave this you know, corporate safety net that I had during the day, leave the comfort of the piano bar and launch into running my own, my own business, which came with its own, its, its own pitfalls. The other lesson there, I think, is how fascinating nonverbal language cues are. Yes. Because I was still in social situations and picking up what other people were saying without saying or, yes. or doing without saying, you know, the, yes. the, the subtle body language. Man, it was fascinating. You talk about, I talked about people watching and how interested, I, how much I like that. Um, it was a whole other level of people watching. The only thing I'll say though is it, it was a little weird whenever somebody would catch me like staring intently and look at me without like, what? You know, normally I'm pretty good with words so I can recover from any like <laughs> awkward situation like that. I couldn't say anything. So I was just like, Mm, mm. You know, I it was that, so that was a bit of an awkward situation. But anyway, I digress. No, but I tell you learned. what you're what you're discussing right now. There's so much wisdom in it. I'm not sure if you're hearing it, but there's so much wisdom. Just even thinking that what you've gained, the wisdom that's come that's was extracted from that hard time is incredible. And like what you're teaching people, I would love you to you know talk about that because what I you said that you take the irk out of work, but you, you're transforming mm -hmm. people's experience of life, which I think of you as you're, you're in a, you're, you became a wise observer, which I think is necessary to be happy in life. Anyhow, God had to shut you up, right? Well, let's, let's align my experience yeah. with maybe what your listeners experience. Life literally shut me up and forced me to pause. And in that time, I noticed some things, some things that I wasn't, wasn't really excited to notice, but that were important for me to notice. And I think how that relates to your listener is that it's easy to believe all the shoulds and the musts and the I have tos in life because life has a has a rhythm it has a, a flow somebody once called it the whirlwind of life it's easy to get caught up in that whirlwind and not find a way out yeah and because of that whirlwind because of all those musts and shoulds and 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 oughts we can make decisions that we don't really want to make but we feel like we must or we ought or we should or we have to make because we're in that whirlwind yeah now, something fascinating happened for everybody, I don't know, two years ago, you know, March 13th, 2020, the world kind of shut down and many people were forced to stop. And judging by things like quiet quitting, the great resignation, the great reset, whatever you want to call it, many people discovered that in their professional life, just like I did in, in my personal life, they weren't really happy with where they were and the decisions that they've made. And many, not all, but many people made, made choices to change that, but some still didn't. And I want to connect with the people that didn't because I get that. Yeah. I, I completely understand because even though the outside world shut down, that didn't mean that the inside world did. Folks who had kids and responsibilities that, that couldn't go away like so many things in COVID did. And so one of the frameworks that I give to people that, that's often helpful to break through that whirlwind is this process called root goal analysis. Because I talked about looking back on my life and seeing very clearly these points where I, I made a decision that didn't really serve me. 
I think we do that a lot as human beings. They, I call them superficial or surface goals. And I hear it all the time, all the time. After an event, when people come up and talk to me, I remember the first time I ever noticed this, I'd just gotten off stage and a man came up and he said, hey, so, so you do coaching, right? I said, well, yeah, you know, on occasion, as long as it's a good fit for me. I said, what, what is it you, you think you want help with? And he said, well, you seem like you got a good business mind and, and I'm trying to buy this 30 unit apartment building. I've never done it before. And I, and I think having a coach would help me do it. Now I've never worked in real estate. I don't know <laughs> a damn thing about finance, but for some reason this man was drawn to me. So I, I leaned in and I wanted to know more. And I said, okay, so, so help me understand, do you work in finance now? Or do you work in real estate now? And he said, no. And I forget what he told me he did, but it was so far removed from real estate or finance. I said, so why a 30 unit? I mean, that's very specific. Why a 30 unit apartment building? And he said, well, I worked out the numbers and that's what's going to give me the financial freedom to go fly fishing with my grandson and to spend more time away. And I said, wait, 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 hold up. So you want the apartment building, which is an industry you've never worked in before and that you're unfamiliar with to give you more freedom of time. He said, yeah, I said, so it's, it's not about the apartment building. It's about the time you'll get. He goes, yeah, I said, I'm just curious. How open-minded would you be if I could share with you ways for you to create more time right now for you to go fly fishing with your grandson and to do the things you want to do? And they didn't involve buying an apartment building or becoming a landlord or taking on a massive mortgage or having to understand real estate finance. Is that, is that something that might interest you? And he paused and he said, yeah, yeah, I, I guess I'd be into that. And that's the magic of this root goal process, because we, we love to create these goals. Again, I call them surface or superficial goals. Like I want to be a manager or I want to own my own business or I want to go to Paris or I need to get a divorce. I mean, whatever it is, we come up with these ideas and we don't ask ourselves so that I can blank. Yeah. Fill in that blank at the end of the day. I want to get a divorce so that I can blank. I want to buy a business so that I can, whatever it is, I want to get promoted. I, I want to raise. What's at the end of that so that I can statement is valuable, but it's often not the end. You know, I want to get a raise so that I can buy a Ferrari. Okay, well now I want to buy a Ferrari so that I can yeah. drive around and impress press people. I want to impress people so that I can feel yeah. better about myself. Yes. And I'm just stopping it there because we could go on and on and on until we get to what I call the root goal, what philosophers call an autotelic goal. That means the goal is the goal. Yeah. And to explain that for people who don't like to geek out on philosophy and psychology like me, think about it like this. If you had to justify why you're physically attracted to a certain type of person, you know, you, eventually you wouldn't be able to explain it other than, I don't know, it's just, it's just what I like. It's what gets me going. Well, that's an autotelic goal. That's the essence of an autotelic goal. You can't distill it any further. Yes. And I think if we approach decisions in our career and in our, per, and in our personal life through that lens, which we have to slow things down, just like losing my voice made me slow things down. Then we start to identify really compelling goals. And the thing about goals is when we start achieving them, it's, it has a compound effect. It becomes a habit. And too many of us, I'll raise my hand and say, I'm probably like the worst offender. Too many of us are in the habit of not achieving goals or giving up on those goals or telling ourselves when we don't achieve the goal, I didn't really care about that much. And that's such a dangerous thing to have happen. Uh, um, listen, I'm paused and not saying anything, which is like a, probably like a, a miracle that I didn't like jump right in and inter interrupt you. But I'm really, really just basking in this wisdom because it's rare. It's rare to this is I know. And I know that I manifested you onto this podcast, by the way, because basically what you're doing, distilling things down to the real, real reason for anything to me is everything. So I just want to say my mini thing, but then I just want you to go. Uh, what I practice actually doing is, so if I want a thing, whatever that thing is, 
I literally go inward and I create the actual answer to what I want. So it could be enthusiasm. It could be, you know, a sense of freedom. It could be peace. You know, it could be, I want to feel admiration. And whatever those feelings are, I can actually like, I practice generating them so that I already have the the byproduct of what I want without mm. getting the thing. And then the thing just kind of swaps to me, it just like lands in my lap and I don't even care if I have it anymore. Now, I don't know if that's too philosophical, yeah. for this conversation, but that's what I'm, that's kind of what I'm hearing about it. I feel like what you're talking about right now is such a high level consciousness that I feel like the whole world needs to hear what you're saying. Don't you? I mean, don't you agree? Because what well, you're describing is changing people's work I, lives. I think. But it's all life, isn't it? It's everything. Yes. Well, I mean, th- there's there's a false dichotomy, and I don't know when it was created, but there's a false dichotomy between work and life. Yeah. Work is eight hours, give or take, of your life. And so when people say, not everybody can love what they do, well, yeah, but but shouldn't we try? Yeah. I mean, it's eight hours. That's one third of most of our life. Not everybody can be a movie star. Not everybody. It, it's not about what you do. Rather, it's about what happens when you do what you do. See, people get wrapped up in this. And there's all sorts of, you know, lovey-dovey anecdotes about the janitor at NASA who met President Kennedy. And President Kennedy didn't know he was a janitor. He didn't have a broom in his hand. But he said, and what do you do, sir? And the janitor said, I make sure the astronauts can get to the moon. Now, that was how he viewed his job. Because okay. sure, if the hallway wasn't clean and an astronaut tripped on a banana peel, that astronaut wasn't going to the moon. That's how that man saw his job. I'm. That's fine. That's important. Yeah. I don't think everybody has to love what they're doing. But what does what you're doing allow you to do? Mm. What's the goal of that goal? Again, I said this earlier, we were kind of off camera, but if the most valuable thing a person gets from their job is a paycheck, they're in the wrong job. Yeah. And the problem is they're waiting for someone to give them the right job, but that someone is not going to show up until you do. You've got to decide what it is you want. Now, Allison, I love your philosophy, which is I may not be able to get the thing now, but I'm going to get the feeling of the thing now. And hey, lo and behold, that often makes it easier for me to get the thing. I think there's value to that. I, I, I've i used that. Um, <laughs> like, but yeah, it's also it not, yeah. it's <laughs> not a bibbidi-bobbidi-boo wand. I know there's some people going, I okay, so I just imagine a million dollars and imagine a million dollars and soon I'll have a million. No, it doesn't <laughs> work like that. But, it. Yes. But it doesn't hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, Zig Ziglar used to say positive thinking won't help me do anything, but it'll help me do everything better than negative thinking will. Yep. And so in that vein, I think manifesting these ideas. And so when I, when I meditate very often, I'll imagine myself on a big stage or landing this big deal. And it does give me that, I call it gratisfaction. I combine gratification and satisfaction. It gives me that gratisfaction of feeling like I did the thing. And I also just want to pause and give everybody a permission slip to say, if you just want a Ferrari because you want a Ferrari, go get you a Ferrari. There's nothing wrong with wanting material things. But try applying that root goal analysis to it anyway. Because here's here's my favorite example to share. I get to speak to kids because I think they need to hear this more than anybody. Because if somebody was telling me this when I was 12, I probably wouldn't have listened. And when I was 16, I probably wouldn't have listened, but maybe by the time I was 18, it would have got, some of it would have gotten in here. So here's what I tell them. I tell, I ask them to raise their hand. I say in the room, if you'd like to have, be a millionaire, almost every hand goes up. Of course, of course. And then I say, why? Mm-hmm. And they look at me like I'm crazy, but I say, no, no, no. Why? Like what'll change when you are a millionaire yep. and almost to a person, maybe not in the exact same words, the answer relates to freedom. They think that that will give them freedom. And so the responsible question I have to ask them is if you could experience that freedom without all the bullshit 
and sacrifice and compromise and upset feelings that you're going to leave in your wake on the path to become a millionaire, would you be interested? Because that's the truth. You want a Ferrari, get you a Ferrari, but that shit's expensive. There are a lot of sacrifices and compromises and hard decisions that go into getting a Ferrari, unless you're manic. Then that's a wholly different thing and I'm not a psychologist, so we're not going to go there. <laughs> yeah. My point is, identifying what we really want makes those obstacles to getting what we want makes them superfluous. They don't matter anymore because we'll find a way to go through them, around them, over them, below them. It doesn't matter. We will figure it out. But if all we do is stop at those root goals, like, yeah, I, I'd like to own a mansion in Boca because that sounds nice. And all of your friends when you're out the brunch are like, oh, yeah, mansion. Oh my God, that would be amazing. You should get a mansion. <laughs> When you realize how hard it is to get a mansion, you'll give up on it. And then you'll be out at brunch again and all your friends, hey, how's that mansion thing? Oh, I, I didn't really want one. I didn't give up on it. And now we've established that pattern of giving up on our goals. And that too becomes a self-fulfilling, a, a virtuous cycle or vicious cycle, I guess, in this case. What would you, you know, it's interesting because I want to understand something, how it relates, because I feel like there's this combination of of how, because I'm a crazy driven person. Like I'll do the steps, I'll do the work that gets me whatever it is that I want, but I also do the inner work as well, right? So what are the things that, and I'm curious about what you would say to me as a business owner, because you work with business owners. So with my employees, I tell them, be the person who has the job that you want here and you'll have that job. So my, the woman who runs my business started as a receptionist and she just became, she believed in herself and she just did the work. So it answers that part of what you're saying, not the bibbity bobbity boo thing, but she was able to conceptualize herself as a person who can do all these things, did those things, and then mm -hmm. now is in charge. So I'm just... I'm curious how that relates to, because your work is really so cool and I want to understand how it all relates. To, to What you're speaking about directly is what I see happen so often and what I experienced. I went to military school. I went to a military high school. And I mean, I, I lived this. I, I thought leaders were basically, you know, anointed or appointed. That that's just somebody goes, and go, Boop, you're the leader. Okay. Boop, you're the leader. But really, leaders appear. Mm -hmm. They appear because you decided to just show up one day and start leading. Mm -hmm. And maybe only one person, maybe nobody followed you. Maybe you were just leading the person you saw in the mirror every morning. But then somebody started following and then somebody else started following and then a few more people. And next thing you know, it's impossible to ignore what you're doing. And the people with the power to make you a an official leader on paper, maybe with the title and, and, and the paycheck, go, here you go. Just like when I step out on stage, my ability to do that didn't happen when you hired me and gave me a check. I've been cultivating this ability since I was three years old, yeah. since I first started playing the piano. In the NBA, only, I'm sorry, in the NHL, only 8% of a professional hockey player's career is spent on the ice in a game. 92% of that career is doing stuff you and I never see or never hear about. Yeah. That's the same way it is with leadership. That's the same way it is with leadership. So the flip, I guess, speaking to employees there and now, now talking sort of to the entrepreneur or, or, or to the leader or the, or the business owner, the flip is making your business an experience people want to have again and again. Yes. Those leaders only stay and have the opportunity to show up if where they're at is where they want to stay, where they want to be. I was just going to ask you that. How do you create that atmosphere as a leader? What would you say yeah. to like me or whoever, you know, an entrepreneur? Yeah. So, well, so we started talking about this off, off camera. There are three principles that I share in, in, in my keynote and they're principles that I've used to create an experience in piano bars. And if you've ever been to a piano bar, I mean, that's, one of the most engaging environments on the planet. Everybody's filling out request slips and play my song. I'm going to play my song. And they're singing along to Sweet Caroline. And Caroline. everybody's you know, ba -ba -da, having fun and clinking so, glasses. I, I mean, that. it's a, is so much it's fun. a high energy, it is. high, highly engaged environment. So how do we, how do we take those principles and put them into business? That's, that's what I share in my keynote. So the first principle is opting in to the organization's experience. How do I know how to fit in? Okay. The question employees want to know after they accept the job is how do I know how to fit in? 
because they assume that you're going to teach them whatever they don't know about doing the job. What they don't expect is that you're going to teach them how to become more, how to become more than they are right now. Now, I know that Maslow's work has you know, largely been debunked right now, but the, the psychologist Abraham Maslow created this idea of Maslow's hierarchy. And at the very top of his pyramid is a concept called self-actualization. What that means in plain English is becoming all that we're capable of being. There's a motivational speaker out there named Jim Rohn. He used to say, the thing about trees is trees will plant their roots as deep in the soil as they can get, and they will grow. They'll grow as high as they can, and they look down on us as if to remind us of how great we could be if we would only get out of our own way. Because the problem with humans is we can choose how much we grow. Yes. What people really want from a leader isn't just to help them be the best therapist assistant or the best, you know, account manager or the best whatever. It's how can I make you the best Allison? How can you make me the best Gregory if I come and work with you? That's what they want to know. And that starts with how can I opt in to being part of the group? Not just how do I opt into doing the work, because clearly you're going to teach me that or else I won't have a job here much longer. How do I really fit in? How do I really make a contribution? At the piano bar, we did that with a little spiel. You walk in the door, well, anybody, and this is the thing you have to understand before I go there. The piano bar environment is not like a Broadway show. The audience is coming and going. I mean, one bachelor party shows up at the beginning of the night and they're there for an hour and a half, but then they leave. And the minute they leave, the tables and chairs they were at, they're, they're already full. So we've got parties coming in and out. So there's people who have never been there before, who were here yesterday. We've got to let everybody know how to fit in. So we had a spiel. And the short version of it went, hey, welcome in. If it's your first time here, we're going to run you through how things go. First of all, it's very unsafe for your vocal cords to sing when they're unlubricated. So go to the bar, get yourself a drink. It doesn't have to be alcohol, but we need you to grab something with which to take a sip. Next thing you need to know, those request slips, those are sitting there on the table in front of you. We are uh, musicians, not magicians. We can't tell what you're thinking. So I need you to write down the name of the song you want to hear. Bring it on up to us at the piano. The third thing, if that request slip comes up without something green and presidential, it's not a request, it is a suggestion. So please make sure you bring a tip up with that request slip and while you're in the tipping <laughs> mood, please take care of your servers, yeah. right? So very quickly in a comical way, I taught you that the three things we value here are community, grab a drink with friends, have a sip. By the way, the more you drink, the better we sound, just saying, but have a sip. Yeah. Second thing we value, collaboration. You're a part of this experience. In fact, this experience is not that good without you. Yes, technically I'm the musical expert in the room. I kind of know what you're going to put on that request slip, but when you put it down and you put a $5 bill with it, you're probably not leaving until you hear that song. So now we're talking about engagement and retention. I've got your engagement and I'm retaining you because you're invested in the creation of this experience. And then the last part, Con consideration. I mean, if we were talking about legal contracts, we'd call it consideration. We could also call it compliment. It's a compliment to receive a tip. You know, if I exert discretionary effort and I play your song, it's nice to know that that discretionary incentive is coming. Yeah. So as a leader, how do you create a culture? How do you create values where people are rewarded for discretionary effort, where they're able to contribute and, be, and, and where they're able to experience some community? Or they feel like they belong. And that's the first principle. That's what I talk about in the keynotes. And there's two more. We don't have time to go into them today, but that's that's where you begin. It begins with values. And I see too many organizations that, you know, all but hire Maya Angelou to write their values statement. And their employees don't even know what they are. They can't tell you. 27% of employees don't even believe in the values that their company puts on the wall. They're just words. We need I to change that if we're really going to create an experience that people want to engage with. Yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. I think we're we're out of time. You are an absolute delight to have here. I feel like what you've done is you've left us wanting more answers to what you do, and which is great. 
because you really you have so, oh, such a what you are really um, a wise and insightful person, truly, and you really have so. Can much I just put that on repeat and I'll play that for my wife? Just like, you can. Oh, yes. a wise and wise, insightful. <laughs> insightful man that you should give every you should give all of your attention to constantly. Like right, tell him how wonderful he is. Yes. But <laughs> yes, and you know what? I'm going to give you the raw content anyhow. But anyhow, so so would you just share with people what you, what you're do, just where they can find you. It's all going to be in the session notes, but I want you to be able to say yeah, what you can offer, yeah. like what you can, what you're here for. Yeah. So, I mean, here's the thing, like we don't have time to go into the rest of it. Yeah. I, I wish we did. But if you want to know more, I think the best place to go is my website, gregoryoffner.com. I'm on all the major socials, Gregory Offner Jr. Check me out on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. You know, I love receiving messages from people that have heard this and say, I want to know more, or I think you're full of shit, you know, whatever. I I want to know how I'm this is resonating, that. what's not resonating, yeah. what's confusing you. Yeah. Because I think that only when we all start talking about the fact that, God, I heard the schema about work is that it sucks and yes. that that's the way it is. Yes. If we change the conversation, we can change the perspective. And when we change the perspective, you know, Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Yes. If we change the way we look at work, work will change. Yes. So that's why I'm so passionate about this conversation. And I'm so yes. grateful that you gave me the opportunity to I'm to so get to grateful you're here. You, and so many people who have businesses are going to just want to like glom you up. Thank you so much it. for being here. Have a beautiful, oh God, beautiful day. Guys, thank you so much for listening to the show. I just want to say to you that we are all together a part of the mission, Mission Awake, a mission that's going to stop the mediocrity that's plaguing all of us. So if you got something here today, I ask that you would be a part of this mission and you'd share it with whoever you can. Take a screenshot of the show and share it on your Instagram. If you are looking for me, you can find me on social media platform, Instagram, Allison Answers or Logger Counseling Services. And give us a, a review and subscribe if you could to YouTube. Allison Answers. That's where you're going to get a lot of content. I drop stuff every day, goofy stuff, all different kinds of stuff. Five-minute videos that just get you moving in your day. Have a great week. See you next time.